My name is Pat Halpin Murphy, um, President and Founder of the Pennsylvania Breast Cancer Coalition. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Linda Miller, who is a pioneer in the field of breast cancer rehabilitation and lymphedema management. Throughout her illustrious career, Linda Miller has treated thousands of breast cancer survivors and conducted significant clinical research that has influenced lymphedema management all around the world. She's a frequent guest lecturer and has numerous professional publications and textbook chapters to her credit. We are extremely fortunate and excited to have a clinician of Linda's caliber and reputation presenting our webinar this evening. So let us welcome Linda T. Miller. Great. Thank you, Pat. And I just want to confirm everybody can see the screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Pat. Um, I wanted to just go over um, this evening's webinar and, and sort of what questions we'll be answering. Um, the first is really what is breast cancer related lymphedema? The second is can it be prevented? And the third is if it happens, how can it best be managed? And so I've got about 40 minutes or so, maybe 35 minutes to uh, tackle this topic and um, we're going to kind of start to do it from sort of beginning to end, soup to nuts, so that you'll probably end up knowing more about lymphedema than many, many of your healthcare providers. I always like to begin um, uh, a presentation to patients talking about some of the do's and don'ts that you may have been told uh, or read since you began your breast cancer journey. As Pat mentioned, I've been doing this for a very, very long time and I, I actually like to collect do's and don'ts uh, from all over the world. And um, so I'd like to kind of go through them and see, see if any of these seem familiar to you. Avoid heavy lifting with the affected arm. Never, never carry heavy handbags or bags with over-the-shoulder straps. Avoid lifting heavy objects to over 10 to 15 pounds. Avoid vigorous, repetitive movements against resistance with the affected arm, and that's scrubbing, pushing, or pulling. Wear rubber gloves when performing such chores as dusting, cleaning the bathroom to prevent accidental scrapes. Wear cotton gloves when ironing, I find that interesting, uh, to protect against accidental burns. Now, if you're going to actually be pouring hot beverages, you should actually wear white cotton gloves. Uh, again, not quite sure why white, but perhaps it's more formal wear. You're going to wear fisherman fillet gloves for slicing and dicing vegetables to avoid accidental cuts and gashes. And I kind of like to end with this one because I almost find it hard to believe that I actually found this in a breast cancer survivor lymphedema pamphlet. And that is, do not hold a cigarette in this hand. Um, I'd like to think that uh, breast cancer survivors may have already considered as to whether or not they want to be smoking. But uh, if you are a smoker, it's recommended that you don't hold the cigarette in that hand. So this is just really a few of the things we haven't even talked about air travel and, and what do we do about that. But as I look at that, it sort of makes me think that we need to put together a, a lymphedema prevention toolkit for the patient. And um, it also makes me think about how crazy uh, you must feel after you read lots of these do's and don'ts. So for example, if we just go on the list that we went over now, we've got our um, oven mitt for baking. We've got our plastic or rubber gloves for scrubbing. We have our white cotton gloves that we need for pouring tea. And we've got our more durable gloves that we use for slicing and dicing vegetables. And of course we can't forget that iron protective wear that we use when we are going to be smoking. 
So again, I imagine that, that anyone who is at fear for getting lymphedema has this wide array of, at the very least, a glove selection that they pick and choose depending upon what activity they're going to use. And to kind of summarize it, I believe that many, many women have, have actually told me that you know, by the time they're done reading or, or listening to what people are giving them advice about lymphedema, they almost feel like they need to enter the world in a hazmat suit. What I'd like for us to do today during today's presentation is hopefully you leave with a pretty good understanding of what is lymphedema, how does it happen, are there preventions, what can you do to reduce your risk, so that you can look at any activity that you want to do, weighs its pros and cons, and then go ahead and do it without any fear and with confidence. Let's start by at least sort of defining lymphedema. Lymphedema is an accumulation of high protein fluid that occurs when your lymphatic vessels are impaired. And one of the things about lymphedema is you can, is you can actually feel it. As a clinician, I can feel when someone's tissue texture is beginning to get thick and patients can also feel that thickening. A lot of times you can actually leave a thumbprint or a dent in your tissue. Sometimes women will get up after they've been sitting on a chair and that chair rail has left a dent in their arm. The reason for that is because of these italicized words here, high protein. What makes lymphedema different from other types of edema is that it has more protein. So it has more of a solid component to it a little more solid, a little less fluid. Now the important point about protein is that protein acts to a sponge, acts like a sponge to water. So that as an arm thickens up, it's going to automatically attract fluid to it. So what's far more important to me is not so much how big is your arm, rather how hard is your arm. Because the hardness of the arm is going to let me know how healthy that limb is. We all swell. To stay swollen is not normal. And so normal fluid fluctuations are going to happen with however hot it is outside, how much um, salt did you eat last night for dinner, whereas the protein content is not going to fluctuate with um, it as simply as that. Now with regards to breast cancer lymphedema, basically there's a few reasons that a woman who's had surgery can predis be predisposed. One is from the surgical removal of axillary lymph nodes. Now we have seen uh, a slight decrease in the incidence of lymphedema since uh, surgeons have begun doing sentinel node dissections. However, many patients will then go on to get subsequent radiation treatment. So even if you've had sentinel node dissection, that chest wall tissue can also be radiated. One of the things that happens with radiation is those vessels, the lymphatic vessels in the skin, actually become damaged or destroyed. So even if you have a minimal number of lymph nodes removed, radiation can precipitate a lymphedema. And then finally, certain chemotherapy regimens can actually uh, precipitate lymphedema. And this is more or less related to the steroid regimens that uh, you're given along with your chemotherapy, lots of it to prevent nausea and vomiting. This entire presentation is evidence-based, but there's only going to be one paper that I actually go into a little bit more detail about. It, it happens to be a paper that I was fortunate enough to be involved in um, with Sandy Norman at the University of Pennsylvania. What makes this study unique is that it was really the first prospective study, meaning that we took women at the time initially of diagnosis, before they even had their surgery, we took measurements and then we followed those women over a five-year period of time. So as opposed to looking at somebody who develops lymphedema and then say, ah, what happened? and back working backwards, we actually tracked women from point of surgery on. 
And again, as I mentioned, it was really the first pro prospective study, and there have been several that have followed. And for the most part, the results have been relatively the same. One of the things that we found was that the cumulative incidence of lymphedema was about 42%. So that actually is, is kind of high. If you have a doctor that says, oh, well, you know, only about 10% of patients get lymphedema. Some of the things that are important there are, well, how many lymph nodes are you talking about? Um, how long did you follow those patients for? Again, what was unique about this study was that we actually followed women um, for five years. In the women that developed lymphedema, the first onset was within the first two years. And that was about in 80% of the cases. In about 89% of the women, it occurred within the first three years. So an important point here is that most lymphedema happens early, within the first couple of years, 89% within the first three years. That does not mean that lymphedema can't happen years and years and years later. The thought is that the longer you go without it, the more likely your body has figured out a way to move lymphatic fluid around. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean that lymphedema can't occur 10 years, 15 years, sometimes 20 years later. And again, because it can happen long term, you want to make sure that anybody that's giving you numbers in terms of incidence, they follow these patients for at least three to five years. And then finally, and I think something that is a testament uh, to a lot of reasons, one of which is, um, is patients who are actually now very aggressive with uh, paying attention to their arm, is that most of the women in our study actually presented with mild lymphedema. So although we do see larger arms um, <clears throat> that we need to manage, fortunately most women are aware uh, to act on the limb if there are any subtle changes and uh, it can be treated rather quickly. I have a picture here of a patient that had a mastectomy and she developed a lymphedema. Um, what's interesting about this particular patient is that her swelling is really just in her fingers and her hand. Um, her arm is actually normal and in fact this particular patient developed lymphedema about eight years after her surgery and so initially it wasn't even thought to be a lymphedema. She was sent to physical therapy because she had carpal tunnel syndrome and, and all of us know that any undiagnosed pain and swelling in the hand is automatically carpal tunnel. Uh, and so she went and had therapy um, for carpal tunnel surgery, got no relief. As it turned out, happened to have a follow-up, just a yearly follow-up with her breast surgeon who said, wait a minute, that's not carpal tunnel, that's lymphedema. And it wasn't until she actually found someone who treated lymphedema that it could have been managed. This is a woman that's had a lumpectomy, and this is kind of your more garden variety lymphedema, sort of your fingertip to axilla swelling. Out of all the thousands of patients that I've seen, I chose these two pictures, or these two patients to juxtapose for a particular reason. Here we have a patient that had more surgery, but she has less edema. We've got less surgery in terms of she's had a lumpectomy, but she has more edema. So an important point here is that it doesn't really matter how much breast tissue you've had removed that sets you up to get lymphedema. Both mastectomy and lumpectomy patients will get some type of axillary dissection if in fact it's an invasive breast cancer. And it's the axillary dissection that actually puts you at greater risk. And of course, many, many women that have lumpectomy will also go on and get radiation therapy. And so they actually, in some studies, have a higher risk of lymphedema than women that have had mastectomy with no radiation therapy. The other point I'd like to make is that lymphedema doesn't have to always be fingertips to axilla. Lymphedema can just happen in the hand. I've had patients that have only thumb swelling or index finger swelling. Um, once swelling begins, we have no idea when it's going to stop. So I can't tell you why this particular patient only developed hand swelling, whereas this weight patient's edema went on a little bit further. 
I'm going to spend just a little bit of time going over lymphatic anatomy, and that's because um, most patients, at least many that I've spoken with, have said that they actually never even heard about a lymph system or didn't even know they had a lymph system until they were told that they had to have lymph nodes taken out. I can tell you that as a physical therapist, having graduated over 20 years ago, um, all we learned about the lymph system was that we had lymph nodes, and then we moved on to the next system. So the lymph system was actually quite new to me as I began treating patients with the condition. This is actually um, a great picture. This is a picture of a wax model, and what's make, what makes it unique is it's a wax model actually from the 1600s, and it's in a medical museum in Italy. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this is because it really gives us a great um, representation of how our lymphatic vessels and our blood vessels work together. So if we kind of point here and we see these red squiggly lines, I'll sort of be non-anatomical here, we've got our arteries. And then we've got these blue squiggly lines, these are our veins. And then we've got all these other clear vessels. <clears throat> all these other clear vessels are actually lymphatic vessels. So we actually have more lymphatic vessels in the skin than we have anything else. And when we're talking about lymphedema that happens in this tissue, it's these lymphatic vessels that we work on as lymphedema therapists to try to help facilitate the lymphatic flow. Now again, the lymph system and the cardiovascular system or your blood vessel system are very closely um, situated and they rely on each other. They're two separate systems, but they rely heavily on helping each other out. The arterial system brings blood into the tissue, and with that blood, fluid leaks out and bathes our cells. Oxygen gives, um, oxygen and protein gives nutrition to our cells. On the other side of that, we've got our venous system, and we know that the veins resorb or bring back to the heart that old deoxygenated blood. They also, uh, the veins also resorb most of the fluid that is in our tissue, about 90%, and takes it back to the heart. We actually circulate about two to three liters of fluid a day in our body, in and out of our tissue. The green vessel here is actually a lymphatic vessel, and it's intimately involved with our cardiovascular system, and it picks up the other 10% <clears throat> that the venous system doesn't carry out. So if the venous system takes out 90% of the fluid, that lymph system is hanging out there to pick up the other 10. It also resorbs larger proteins that are too big to fit in the venous system. So to keep it simple, in terms of our fluid balance, whatever the arteries bring in, the veins and the lymph system have to take back out again. So again, to swell is normal, to stay swollen is not. So we go out for a run on a hot day or eat a little bit more popcorn than usual, we might swell a little bit. But if our systems are intact, our body does what it needs to do to actually bring that back down um, to baseline. If one of the systems are impacted, whether it be the lymph system or we'll talk about a little bit, the venous system, then that fluid balance gets altered. Let's go into a little bit of detail about the lymph system and then we'll get into the good stuff about treating. The lymph system is actually spread throughout our body, and as I mentioned, it's a separate system from the cardiovascular system. Let's start and talk about what most of us were familiar with maybe before we had cancer, and that's actually lymph nodes. I'm going to mention, I'm going to start with lymph nodes, not because they're the most important, but because it's the most familiar for most of us. We've got lymph nodes spread throughout our body, anywhere from 600 to 1,500, depending upon who you're talking to. Lymph nodes are actually filtering stations. And they're important uh, to filter out things like broken cells, toxins, uh, cancer, anything like that, that that we don't want to be spreading around our body. So as lymphatic fluid works its way through the tissue all the way back up to the heart, it goes through a series of lymph nodes that will filter it, then the fluid goes out some more, more lymph nodes filter it so that by the time the fluid 
gets its work, works its way back to the heart, hopefully it's been filtered out by impurities by the lymph nodes. Now, if you have lymph nodes taken out, say for example you have an axillary dissection, you have less lymph nodes trying to do the same amount of work, and that can actually end up um, causing a backwash or congestion. Now, the lymphatic vessels are actually far more exciting to those of us that work uh, with um, lymphedema because that's where we direct a lot of our efforts. The most important point really about this slide is I wanted to just comment that there's lots of different sizes of lymphatic vessels um, from real, real tiny fragile ones. You get a little bit larger lymphatic vessels. One important point here is that lymphatic vessels actually have valves. So just like veins, lymph vessels have valves. So as we get older, we can get kind of varicose veins in our legs or varicosities. We can actually get lymphatic vascularity insufficiencies or uh, lymphatic varicosities that may end up leading to problems down the road. Of course, these we actually can't really see nearly as much as we can see um, venous issues. But it's one of the reasons why people can be fine for a while and then over time their lymph system kind of poops out because those valves become incompetent. The main reason I really wanted to show this particular picture is to remind me to tell everybody that there are at least six different ways by which the arm can drain from the lymphatic fluid. Um, so when the fluid goes in the arm and works its way back out, all the way out through, through the axillary lymph nodes, that's where those lymph nodes are removed when you have a dissection. Well, there are some pathways that actually bypass those lymph nodes. And so who develops lymphedema and who doesn't might purely be based, onto your based on your anatomy, whether or not you have pathways that run through the axilla or maybe bypass the axilla. The vessels of the chest wall, the lymphatic vessels of the chest wall, also drain into that same axilla. Now, why is that important? Because if you have lymph nodes taken out, not only could the arm swell, but there could be fullness on the chest wall or the lateral trunk. The breast could also swell. That's because 80% of the breast drains into the axillary lymph nodes. So removing those axillary lymph nodes can predispose a patient to have arm swelling, as well as anterior chest swelling. In addition, the lymphatic vessels of the upper back also drain into that same axilla. So again, if a woman has lymph nodes taken out, it wouldn't be unusual for them, for her to experience swelling in the arm, sometimes a feeling of fullness in the upper back, in the anterior chest, or in the breast. That's why our treatments have to be designed on treating the entire upper quarter that's been involved when lymph nodes are com when lymph nodes come out. Ultimately, all of our lymphatic fluid works its way back up to the heart, and so the lymph system meets the circulatory system back up at the top of the heart at the vena cava. This is actually one of the reasons why we always want to have a good diagnosis um, when we have a patient that has edema because ultimately we're taking fluid and moving it back to the heart. If someone doesn't have a healthy heart or they're actually developing swelling because of an incompetent heart, the last thing we want to do is move fluid back up to the heart and possibly risk um, causing complications. So you want to make sure that you're going to somebody that fully understands your medical history and that you've got a good understanding as to why you may have developed swelling. Most of the time, if you've gotten, if you've had breast cancer, it's because you've had lymph nodes taken out and then subsequent treatments. There are two sources of edema formation. One is lymph drainage failure. So we've already talked about that. You get your lymph nodes out, you get radiation therapy, your lymph system poops out. There's something else that's interesting that they found and we've actually known in breast cancer patients since the 1930s. And that shows that not only is there a lymph drainage problem, but some women actually have problems with their veins taking fluid out as well. So we can actually see here um, this particular patient in her involved side on her chest wall she actually has some lymph varic varicosities. 
Her uninvolved side, tissue looks fine. Involved side, some varicose veins on the chest wall. Here's a patient just relatively new after her mastectomy, and already we can start to see how those veins are working double time. So from a fluid balance perspective, we need to keep in mind that if we want to treat someone swelling, we need to add both lymphatic management and venous management. That's the way we're going to maximize reduction. The focus is always on lymphatic, lymphatic flow, lymphatic flow, lymphatic flow. You'll hear a lot of us talk about venous return. That's one of the reasons why exercise can be such a beneficial treatment, because exercise not only working on the lymph system, but is a great way to actually increase venous return. So if you want to best attack swelling after breast cancer, you must pay attention to not just your lymph system, but your venous system as well. It's by attacking all of those systems that you'll actually get maximum reduction. Now that leaves us to a burning question I didn't want you to think that I, I forgot about when we started with our first uh, part of the presentation on um, lymphedema prevention. And I guess the burning question is, can lymphedema be prevented? There are lots of studies that are being done um, after a woman's had lymph nodes taken out, maybe putting her in a compression garment as a prevention, maybe doing exercise as a prevention. At this point, there is no definite way that we know how to prevent lymphedema other than not taking lymph nodes out and then not getting subsequent radiation. But again, since the most important thing uh, about breast cancer and treatment is to get the proper treatment, until we have better uh, solutions, we've got to learn how to better manage the lymphedema that can happen. Remember, lymphedema doesn't happen most of the time. Now, if you're one of those people that has it, I understand that it's important. But the fear of lymphedema should hopefully never be uh, a reason why you pick or choose a particular uh, cancer treatment. Now, even though we can't prevent lymphedema, we can reduce our risks. One of those things is going to be to protect the skin. So whether it be by having the selection of gloves that we talked about earlier, your white cotton, your cotton, your fisherman fillet gloves, we want to protect the skin. Anytime you get a break in the skin, you get lymphatic fluid that rushes to that area. Well, now you're rushing lymph fluid into a limb that may not be able to handle it because you had lymph nodes taken out. So whether you get a break in the skin from a thorn of a rose or from a sterile needle, your body does the exact same inflammatory response. What we don't know why is that women can get a thousand mosquito bites and then on the thousand and number one, they begin to swell. So whatever that means for you, protect your skin. Going hand in hand with that is watch for signs of infection. That could be pretty obvious signs, red, big red, blotchy um, um, marks on the arm. can also be a little bit more subtle. I'd like you just to kind of pay attention here and see how there's some redness on the arm and just a little bit fades away as you go into the chest wall. This is an example of somebody that has a mild cellulitis that has not yet flared in to anything greater. As soon as this begins to show, you want to get on antibiotics um, to decrease chances of infection or to have that infection uh, not get worse. I want to mention also that breast cellulitis is something that's common. This also gives me the opportunity to mention that um, breast lymphedema or breast edema is also a very common uh, problem. It's oftentimes an unspoken problem. Um, it's, it's in the literature, but a lot of women uh, feel that, well, because I, I, I can't put a pump on it or I can't put a sleeve on it, I don't really know what to do because it's not in my arm. Just know that there is treatment available for breast edema as well. The final point I wanted to make with regards to infection is you don't have to have a fever um, and, and have an infection. So sometimes women will say, well, my arm got red, but I didn't get a fever. That doesn't have to always go hand in hand. What I will tell my patients is any sudden change in status of the arm 
any more pain than usual, uh, any increase in swelling that you didn't have before, any redness you didn't have before, call your doctor and make sure that it's not an infection. A fever does not have to accompany it. Sometimes it does, but many times it doesn't. You want to get your shoulder range of motion back to normal. That will go as we talk about exercise and using your arm. Normal movement helps normal fluid transport. So get your shoulder range of motion back as much as possible. You want to return to activity gradually. The word gradual is in italics. I firmly believe that anybody that's had breast cancer surgery can go back and return to any activity they want to do whether it's powerlifting, whether it's gardening, uh, whether it's your job on an assembly line. Um, any of those things are possible as long as you go back and do that activity gradually. One of the things that we know that has shown up in the research is that you want to maintain a healthy body weight. Now, what the research has actually shown us is not so much that if you're heavier, you're more at like, likely at risk to get lymphedema. Rather, the research shows that women who gain weight from the time that they've had breast cancer surgery tend to be more at risk for lymphedema than women who maintain normal weight. And many of us know that breast cancer treatment itself actually causes a certain amount of weight gain. Um, so it predisposes you uh, to, to actually being um, having a problem with lymphedema. So maintain a healthy body weight. If you do gain weight with your breast cancer treatment, um, do what you can to, to, uh, to knock that weight back off again. That will help minimize your risk for lymphedema. Let's move on to treatment. And now that we've actually talked about the anatomy and how lymphedema happens, treatment actually becomes kind of common sense. One of the things um, that I use a lot with my patients and I encourage all women to do is exercise. Compression therapies, bandage or garments. Manual lymphatic therapy is a massage technique. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, using a compression pump. Some of the things we're going to talk about today may be a little controversial. Um, as I mentioned, everything we're going to talk about is evidence-based. So um, there's research that supports what I'm talking about. It still doesn't mean that it maybe isn't a little bit controversial. So let's start with exercise. Um, exercise can be, you know, basically uh, anything. It could be weight training. It could be something um, aerobic. Uh, it could be golfing. Uh, any kind of leisure activity. But I um, also gardening. Uh, but I also want to comment that it's not always sort of quote exercise. Um, not always leisure activity. Sometimes it's what we have to do for a living. So when we, I'm very cautious when I tell patients don't do this or don't do that because possibly for their, for their life, because they've got a three-year-old or because they've got a job that involves repetitive activity, they actually need to do that. So telling them to avoid it is a little bit unrealistic. Lymphatic fluid moves with movement. I say that a hundred times a week to my patients. That's one of the ways we can control your lymphedema is by having you exercise. When you increase your activity, you actually increase your lymphatic flow two to three times higher than when you're sedentary. We also know that taking nice deep breaths can actually increase our venous and lymphatic return. So based on this physiology, we want to do a good stretching program. We want to stretch out our chest wall, stretch out the axilla. Um, for many women, they have a little divot in that armpit area where they had lymph nodes taken out. Even though the range of motion may be really good, they have a little bit of tightness at the end. What I will tell my patients is, if you have some lymphedema, your range of motion is good, but we want it to be better than good. We can also add some light weights to your program. It doesn't have to be weights at a gym or f dumbbells. You can also just use cans of soup or bottles of water. Anything that's going to get those muscles to contract. Muscle contraction helps increase lymphatic flow. So you can use free weights, machines if you go to the gym. The important thing is start out lightly, meaning one to two pounds. This is even if you have lymphedema. Start out lightly. If your arm is swelling, it's telling you that your body is not handling the lymph, the lymph flow that's happening. So you want to do the activity, 
and then monitor the limb. If the arm does okay within the first 24 hours, you can actually increase your weights or repetitions. The important thing as well is use all the muscles of the group of the arm, not just the hand, not just the forearm. Use the entire arm to actually facilitate better lymphatic flow when you exercise. Now we mentioned that deep breathing actually helps enhance lymphatic return, and so that can be achieved um, through, again, aerobic activities. If you're a golfer, uh, as I am, um, maybe instead of riding the cart, maybe you decide to walk the 18. Um, again, just thinking about that I'm increasing my lymphatic flow, and I can actually, if I have lymphedema, I can actually maybe perhaps walk when I golf as opposed to drive my cart so that I'm actually enhancing my lymphatic flow. So when you're going to return to activity, you want to recondition the arm through a controlled and gradual program. You want to monitor the response of the limb. If something's going to cause that arm to swell, it's going to cause it to swell within 24 hours. If you do an activity on Monday and your arm swells on Thursday, it was probably not the activity that you did on Monday. So it's a pretty much stimulus response. It'll let you know. And the other thing you hear a lot about is do use compression when you're active. So whether that's when you're exercising, you're shoveling snow, you're gardening, maybe you're on the assembly line at work. If you need to have compression, use it when you're doing these activities. I'd like to just move into uh, talking a little bit about compression and in particular the bandages and the garments. Now, those of you that know me and have had me um, as your therapist know that I'm a big believer in compression bandages, um, and I feel badly that they've been maligned over the years. Um, back in the 1700s, this uh, surgeon actually said that the use of bandages is in fact supremely important since bandages are often much more effective than many other remedies. I can guarantee you that if you um, are comfortable with your bandaging, you can do it yourself, that you know where and when to bandage, you will actually get better results than if you don't bandage. Research has shown that exercise with the limb bandage increases your lymphatic flow. Patients who continue to bandage as part of their maintenance program do better than those who stop bandaging. So once you're done with lymphedema therapy, if you keep bandaging, and the research shows even if it's just three times, three nights a week, you can actually get better reduction than if you say, oh my goodness, I can't stand these bandages, I can't wait to be out of them. Those women tend to actually regress. Now, one of the reasons why bandages are so maligned is because this is an example of, of what we're asking patients to do. This may look very familiar to many of you. Um, what I suggest is that we actually do away with lots and lots of layers, lots and lots of padding, depending upon what the patient needs. So every bandage that I do with my patients is going to be very different, and it also needs to be user-friendly. What I call quick and dirty bandage or streamlined bandaging. This book was actually published in 1917, but I think we can go back to it for some good information. The women that I work with will actually do, um, as I had mentioned, sort of a quick and dirty bandage. This is a wrap that they can do by themselves. Wrap fingertips to axilla um, and use padding when appropriate. Padding does not need to be done on every arm. Or once you start with padding, it doesn't need, mean that you need to do it forever. So the way that I will treat my patients is patients will wear their bandages at nighttime so they support the elasticity of the skin, and they wear it when they exercise. So they enhance lymphatic flow when they're active. But then they go all day without compression on the arm. So a majority of my patients do not wear compression sleeves during the day. Now, believe me, that has led to a lot of... Um, unhappiness, not so much amongst my patients, but amongst some of the other healthcare providers that treat and feel very strongly about how to manage lymphedema. Um, I believe that if we actually um, get a user-friendly way to use the bandages, 
as well as to exercise, we can actually go all day without something on our arms. In terms of garments, this is sort of our common compression uh, garment if you're going to wear one. Um, again, I find sometimes they're a little bit difficult. They get in the way. If you've got to wash your hands several times throughout the day, it's difficult. What we came up with, um, instead of bandaging, because we made bandaging so horrible, were these things that are called nighttime garments. Some of these may look familiar to you. Um, again, um, to me, uh, it's a little bit like sort of wearing an oven mitt um, to bed um, and then bandaging on top of an oven mitt. Um, for some patients, they're beneficial. I find that with a good bandage, a quick and dirty wrap, that's the most um, that's sort of tailored to the patient. That you might get better results than than using um, these other products. They're out there. Uh, again, um, if you're using them and they work, great. Um, but just know that sometimes the quick and dirty bandage may be the way to go. Manual lymph therapy is a technique that you get when you, uh, if you go to a lymphedema therapist. It's a massage technique that involves decongesting proximally so that we can then move the fluid and shunt it to an area of the body that's working properly. So, for example, if this woman's had her lymph nodes out here, manual lymphatic therapy allows me to take lymphatic fluid that's congested here and drain it to other parts of the body that are working. A compression pump is also a little bit uh, controversial. I want to mention it because actually compression pumps do decrease limb volume. Here's a patient. We saw her picture earlier. Here she is after an hour on the pump. The problem is that research show that pumps do not move protein. And so one of the reasons that lymphedema pumps fell out of fashion is because your lymphedema therapist would say, ah, Lymphedema is high protein, pumps don't need protein, pumps are bad. Well, what we do know about pumps is they increase venous return. And one of the things we talked about earlier was that up to about 70% of women that have breast cancer lymphedema have venous problems in that arm as well. So I'll tell my patients or I'll tell my naysayers, I'm not using that compression pump to treat the lymphatic component of the edema. I'm using that pump to treat the venous component of the edema that I know exist in many patients. The most important thing is always use it as an adjunct to other treatments. The pump by itself is not the answer because it doesn't move protein. So over time, you'll have to continue to pump and you won't get the same kind of results because the protein gets stuck in the arm. And remember, wherever there's protein, there's fluid. I want to finish with uh, just some outcomes. And just to kind of show you a little bit about uh, some of the reduction that we can get, this is a patient um, who had more of a, a moderate lymphedema, um, pretty much through the forearm and hand. One of the things that we pay a lot of attention to is getting the anatomical architecture back again. Um, we may not always be able to get rid of the lymphedema, but I want to take that limb, and I want to take an arm that looks like a club, and not just make it a smaller club, but make it look more like an arm. And so we pay a lot of attention to anatomical detail. This is the kind of things that you can achieve with a good bandage. This patient was seen twice a week, and this is just a four-week photo. So this is after eight treatments. She bandaged at night, did not wear a garment during the day. Here's another patient who has primarily really just kind of hand edema. Uh, she did not seek treatment until she began uh, to notice the swelling in her hand. For this particular patient, we actually bandaged fingers to elbow, and she performed exercises. Saw her twice a week for four weeks. Here she is at eight weeks out. I'm sorry, here she is at eight visits. Uh, this patient wraps at nighttime and does not wear a sleeve or a glove during the day. The important thing is that you want to be able to see progress with each visit that you have or with each treatment that you have, you want there to be a difference, whether it's a size difference or a, a tissue texture difference. Here's a patient has a pretty significant lymphedema. Um, I saw her, again, just twice a week. Here she is during her third visit, and this is primarily achieved by exercise and bandaging. 
tweaking the bandaging a little bit as the limb changes, we can see that the limb continues to reduce. So this is after six visits, twice a week. Now she's still work in progress and still has some work to do. But again, I wanted to prove or wanted to show that you don't need to wait months and months before you can get reduction. Well, I, I want to mention this guy. He gave me permission to use his picture. This is Big Eddie. And Big Eddie has a pretty significant lymphedema, as you can see. Um, Big Eddie is a chef. He had cancer and um, had lymphedema and basically has lived with his arm like this for 10 years. Has had multiple, multiple rounds of complete decongestive therapy. Has had every pump on the market, every bandage, every night garment, everything. And this is what his arm looks like. And so I was asked to come in and take a look. Basically what I did with Big Eddie was said, you know what, let's back it up, let's go back and let's take a look at just bandaging this properly and getting you exercising. Here's Big Eddie at six weeks. Twice a week, bandaging and exercising. He bandaged at nighttime and when he exercised. There he is being able to raise his arm up over his head. That's a genuine smile that Big Eddie has there. And again, here, at six weeks, look at how that hand is now visible. But that's still work in progress. I'm not going to discharge Eddie because we still have a ways to go. So I tweaked my bandages, managed it, changed it around a little bit. And here he is at 12 weeks. That limb continued to get smaller. So even at this point, I'm not going to fit him for a garment until I've gotten that skin to zip back as best as possible and make that limb as small as possible. So we work on size and we work on shape. Now the most important thing with any lymphedema treatment is to make sure that you get long-term results. I can show you hundreds of pictures of patients that look really good after I've finished treatment with them. The most important thing is that the patient is able to maintain those results. And that's what we're looking for, is long-term results. And honestly, I believe in some ways we maybe have failed patients by not being able to give a really good long-term management program. So what matters to me, and hopefully what matters to you as a patient, is not so much how do I look when I'm done with getting my massages and my wraps and my bandages and everything else, how do I look when I'm on my own? And here's a perfect example of a patient that's been able to manage her own edema on her own independently by bandaging and exercise. So finishing with um, some facts. Remember, most women don't get breast cancer lymphedema. Every case is different, so you don't want to have a generic treatment plan that your friend got. Everybody's arm is different, so every treatment plan should be different. And finally, if you catch lymphedema early, it's a very manageable condition and can be controlled throughout your lifetime. Thank you. Now ready for some questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Our first question this evening is, what are the recommendations about using the affected limb for blood pressure and IV sticks? Any time frame, years or months, is it okay to use? Uh, that question comes up a lot. Um, the answer to that is, is probably not going to be um, a, a good one to hear, but there actually is no evidence that says that it's actually ever safe to um, get needle sticks or blood pressure. Now, that being said, there really isn't evidence that says that needle sticks and blood pressure actually can cause lymphedemas. So the important thing is if you've got another arm, you can use it. There really isn't a time frame. Um, the thought is sometimes the longer you go without a problem, the more likely that a periodic blood stick or a periodic blood pressure will be okay. Um, but if you can, use the other arm. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, can you please explain cording? Yes. Um, cording is also called, um, the, sort of the medical term for that is uh, sclerosing lymphangitis. And basically, that's scarring of the lymph system. Remember those lymphatic vessels that we saw in that wax model from the 1600s? 
those thin, thin vessels. All those vessels are working their way up to the lymph nodes in the armpit. When you get lymph nodes taken out, the lymphatic vessels that were heading to those nodes become inflamed. And whenever there's inflammation, there's actually scar tissue. So you actually will get scar tissue that lays itself down along that lymphatic vessel. And that's how you get the term cording, because it literally can look and even feel like a cord that's going down through the arm. Women will say it feels like a pulling feeling or a drawing feeling. Um, having cording does not mean that you're going to get lymphedema. They are two separate conditions. Almost everybody that has lymph nodes taken out will go on and get cording. It's a self-limiting um, problem. It usually goes away in three to four weeks, especially with some good stretching. Um, and having cording does not mean that you're at any greater risk than getting lymphedema. Okay. What would you suggest for steroid-induced lymphedema? Steroid-induced lymphedema is um, actually one of the easier lymphedemas to treat. And in fact, a lot of times if, I, if I've got a patient that, uh, say for example, she's on Taxol and that's exactly when, or Taxotere, and that's when she began to swell, we can usually correlate it with when she started doing steroids. If somebody has steroid-induced edema, it's really the fluid component that's increasing, not so much the protein component. And so it's actually easier to treat the fluid piece. That's a kind of patient that actually will do really well, maybe with a mild diuretic, um, will do well with a compression pump. People that have steroid-induced edema, that edema will usually resolve when the steroids are removed if it's been treated. So many of these women do not need to go on and wear a sleeve or even bandage every night forever. Um, it's when you remove the steroid over time, the edema resolves. Okay. I was told to wear not to wear a sleeve while sleeping. You mentioned bandaging at night. Does this mean that you can wear a sleeve when you sleep? Uh, no. <laughs> um, the, there's a little bit of a difference between uh, the, the, what makes up a bandage and what makes up a sleeve. Many sleeves actually are elastic. And it's um, because sleeves are elastic, they actually really don't want you to wear them at nighttime because over time, the elastic actually begins to get a little bit tighter. Compression bandaging is what we call the inelastic or short stretch um, product. And when applied properly, you don't have a problem with that tightening up throughout the night. So uh, bandages are short stretch and have no elastic in them. Garments have elastic in them and therefore should not be worn at night. Okay. When you feel heaviness or pain, can you use heating pads or ice packs? A lot of times, I mean, I, uh, the caveat to that is it really depends on what's, what's causing it. Um, if you, for example, say you're a tennis player and you developed, played a lot of tennis over the weekend and you have a little bit of uh, tennis elbow, there's nothing wrong with putting a little bit of either moist heat or ice to treat the inflammation of the tennis elbow. Ice and heat by itself is not really going to be effective in treating edema because it's a short-term fix. You're going to cause, if it's heat, vasodilation, which can actually bring more blood flow to the area, more fluid. Ice will cause some constriction and decrease swelling, but again, it's short-term. So I will have patients use heat and ice if they're using it to treat something else that's going on in the arm, more likely an injury, um, overuse problem, not to treat their lymphedema. All right, our next question. We have heard a lot about the LDEX test to determine the probability of a woman dealing with lymphedema. Do you recommend this test? Um, the LDEX is is, is interesting. Um, it's being used in some ways as a predictor um, at this time, uh, Medicare does actually does not um, approve. There's no code for actually using the LDEX or bioimpedance for checking lymphedema. Um, I think that it's intriguing. Um, honestly, I do not believe at this time that it would be something that I would invest in um, in in deciding whether or not I'm going to have a, get a, a that a patient's going to get lymphedema. It's the predictive value of 
of whether or not it predicts lymphedema is, is a little bit questionable, and I think some more work needs to be done with the LDEX. All right, thank you so much. Um, we're out of time for this evening, but if you want to keep answering questions, I can send them to you in an email. That's great, absolutely. We just want to thank you so much for coming on and presenting about lymphedema this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Linda Miller. I know that this has been a great benefit uh, to the breast cancer survivors uh, on the webinar who have been touched by lymphedema. So we thank you with all our hearts uh, for doing this for us tonight. Thank you. Bye-bye now.